actually we will do slightly different. The second would be interrupt service routines. Next would be uh, virtual memory and the last will be on what you call as task switching. These four are very important concepts uh, which you need to understand to finally appreciate why certain things are done by the operating system and the compilers, right. So, if you want to have a good understanding of that, then understanding these four concepts in detail is a must, okay. So, each will carry 20 marks, we will try to, uh, see again like, uh, like in the previous semester course, I want you to understand it first. So, just getting a working code will not give you marks, but we will have a very strict viva versi, okay. So, we will like, we'll ask you a lot of conceptual questions there and we want you to answer those questions. So, this 20 marks would be directly proportional to how well you handle the viva versi, okay. So, understand and do the code. I do not even mind you, you know, I will not use the word copying, I will be diplomatic, discussing with yourself and doing the code, okay. So, I do not really mind that. But when it comes to IOC, it is going to be one on one and um, I want you to answer those questions very clearly, okay. That we will check your thoroughness there, okay. So, this is not more of uh, a skill, but it is more of an understanding that we want to develop through this lab, okay. Um, so, when we teach you these things, like we will, we will cover some background material for each one of these four and that will happen in the first 45 minutes of each lab course, okay. So, everywhere there will be, I will talk about uh, influence of compilers on segmentation and influ influence of operating system on segmentation, right. Similarly, influence of compilers on uh, ISRs and OS on ISRs. ISR essentially stands for interrupt service routine, okay. Um, the way, way you can uh, show yourself as high funda, the easiest way of showing yourself as high funda is to have a lot of these abbreviations memorized. So, ISR, ISR, you can talk an entire talk you can give just with abbreviations, okay. Also virtual memory and then task switching. So, what I will do today is that I will give, I, I will now talk for another half an hour and I will tell you what each uh, assignment. Uh, what it means to complete this assignment, what, what are the objectives of this assignment, why these four things that I have put here, okay. When a program wants to get executed, the program essentially will have three blocks. So, your A dot out, if you go and see how it is getting executed, it, it needs three different parts of memory, right. So, let us just start, uh, when, we, when we want to execute a program, so, each instruction will undergo five different, each execution of an instruction will be in five phases, correct? What are those phases? I will fetch the instruction and increment the program counter. Next. Decode, Decode the instruction. Fetch the data. Execute the instruction and store back the results, okay? So, at least three of this, right? Fetching the instruction, fetching the data storing back the result, at least three stages I may be touching the memory, right. So, a program essentially has three components, one is the instruction that we are trying to execute, the second is the data that I am going to use and the third is obviously the stack. Why do we need the stack? Again, we will explain in more detail. We have, we have done quite a bit of stack work in our third semester course, right, lot of stack you have seen both in your data structure plus in the uh, foundation to computer system design. We will see more of that stack here. So, there are three different segments that are necessary when you want to execute a program, right. And two important things come up. One is that when I look at a mail server for example, there are two processes that are executing together, right. So, one process will execute, halfway in its execution it may be pulled out, another process will go and start executing, then only it can give a feeling that it is serving all of you, right. 
if four of you log into a Gmail server, Google server, right? Then you start typing the email. Till you finish the, your email, the other fellow has to wait, right? Then you get really frustrated. There will be one million users. So, so the entire CPU is scheduled so that you get some time, then you are pulled out, then he gets some time. So everybody has a feeling that the server is giving some service to it, right? So when more than one process, one, what is a process? Program in execution, right? So I have hello world.c, that is a C program. I compile it, I get a dot out, that is an executable program. <coughs> so I press dot slash a dot out and press enter, <coughs> then that executable program starts executing, then it becomes a process. So a process is nothing but a program in execution. Now there will be several programs in execution, right? So each program, each process will have its own code, its own data and its own stack, right? So, so when I look at the memory, there will be P1's instruction, P1's data, P1 stack, then, okay, then there will be P2 instruction, P2 data, P2 stack. Now, I will have P3 instruction, P3 data, P3 stack. When P3 came, I did not have contiguous memory location, so right? it need not be contiguous. So there are three segments, that is why we call it as segmentation. There are three different segments that are associated with each program, right? each process. Now, I need to protect these segments, correct? For example, P1 should not go and look into P2's instruction data or stack or P3's instruction data or stack. Are you getting this? P1, then what will happen? It may go and uh, you know it can change something in P1, P2's data or P2's instruction and then the correctness of execution will not be there. When I, when I compile a program and I know it is correct, I expect it to execute correctly. No external uh, factor should not come and change the execution of my program. That is what I guarantee to the user, right? So, since you have coded a program and you are syntactically and semantically correct, syntax means the, the grammar, semantics means is the meaning, the logic, okay? You are syntactically and semantically correct and you start executing in my machine, the operating system should ensure that your program will execute in the way you want. If some other program comes and, right, uh, you know, changes your execution or changes your data, then you will not get the desired result. So one of the responsibility of the operating system is to see that P1 should not go and access P2's instruction or P2's data or stack. P1 should not have access to the other thing, right? So this is what we call as inter-process protection. I should, I call this as inter-process protection. One process data stack and code is protected or isolated from the other process instruction data and stack. Okay? Now, how do we achieve this? We achieve this through what we call as segmentation. One of the ways of achieving is through segmentation. The next important requirement from the operating system end is that myself so what is a stack, right? So what are the two operations on the stack? One at a time. Push and pop. Ah, push and pop. So, so let us say this is stack and this is data, right, for P1. Hmm? Now I am keeping pushing into the stack. Push, 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 push. Then what happens? I go and push into the data of that fellow, right? I, into myself. I am pushing and I go and overwrite my data. Push, 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 everything is gone. Are you able to follow what I am saying? Right? So I start pushing into my stack. I have access to my data, my code, and my stack, correct? So I start pushing and I keep overwriting into my data, I start overwriting into my 
instruction right then what happens my entire program is execution is completely gone right similarly i start executing program count what is a program counter program counter points to the next instruction that we need to execute now what will happen i keep on executing one after another after another after another, and i start executing something from the data i start considering my data as a instruction so i keep i keep executing and i pass the boundary and start some mistake happen i start executing from data now these things your uh, your operating system should cut in if it has given me this much amount of stack if i overshoot the stack it should say stack overflow if i start executing outside my segment then it should say segmentation fault seg fault core dump all these things you have seen right yes or not yes, yes. so core dump all these things should come so who is giving this the operating system should give now let us go into one fundamental question i think one of you asked i don't know who asked this question last time so core dump that comment is coming right who will give that core dump comment who is printing that comment core dump segmentation fault who is printing it ha huh? compiler Uh, some program in execution only can print it so operating system is printing it but when it is printing it when your program executes and you do some error the operating system comes and prints for you so suppose i have only one cpu right this was happening even when i did programming right where there were only one cpu in that cpu right in that cpu my program is running the program that is going to do a seg fault right that is going to do that uh, do that mistake that program is running and it did that mistake right how will the operating system come and print it is also a software it is also it should also execute to go and print something right i should also execute to print something so operating system is a software which is on on your memory ram my program is currently executing here i did a mistake but now you go and say that mistake is the the mistake that we have done that mistake what that mistake is is being printed by the operating system how you are understanding this operating system is also a software it has to execute to go and print an error message correct now i am executing there's only one cpu operating system obviously cannot execute there i am executing i did a mistake and then there is a statement segmentation violation or core dump whatever but you say that the operating system comes and prints there how can it do are you getting my question yes or no yes now you tell me how no how will i know that i have done a mistake I I I am instruction that I do by divide by zero. So how will I know that I have done a mistake? You are not writing right. You are not writing callback routines and all inside. You just write a program which will do whatever you want it to do, and there some mistake has happened. Right? Okay. The point is, I need the hardware support for it. so when i do a mistake the hardware will catch and then transfer control a hey, you have done a mistake stop it will throw you out of the cpu bring in the operating system and tell the operating system hey this guy has done some mistake go and attend to it then the operating system will find out what mistake you have done and it will go and print it so there is a switch from your program to operating system we are understanding this correct so when you do a mistake when you do a divide by zero so a division instruction comes to the arithmetic logic unit alu with the denominator as zero then immediately it will it will stop your execution you are not fit to be executor you don't know how to even divide so it will throw you out it will go and call the operating system and say this fellow is trying to do something why don't you attend to it so the operating system will be loaded so your program will go out to the ram and the operating system will get loaded and then operating system will start executing 
and then it will find out what error it is and then it will give right. So, for me to have, so the thing that we are now talking of here, if you call that the earlier one as inter process protection, what is this? Intra process protection. right intra process protection i try to write i try to overgrow my stack i have been given some space but i try to overgrow that i overgrow i overwrite into my data i overwrite into my instruction memory correct now somebody has to stop me so how will the architecture stop you and how will the control go to the operating system so what is the so this is a nice uh, you know this this entire uh, you know handling of this is done jointly by the hardware and the operating system now what you need to understand is what is done by the hardware and what is done by the operating system you, you need to have a very clear idea correct then you will appreciate how these things are going to happen so so before that some way i should know that i am overshooting my stack or i am overshooting my execution right my instruction is only 2000 bytes, I am trying to execute something more than that 2000 bytes or my stack is only 500 bytes, I am going more than 500 bytes, right. My data will start from here and end here, but I am now shooting, overshooting it. Somewhere I should deduct that I am overshooting it, right. And those things, that deduction is basically done using segmentation, right. So, segment to sum up segmentation does two things one is inter process protection you are process one you are process two you cannot see his data code and stack and you cannot see his code data and stack you cannot execute or look into it perfect isolation like putting one big barrier wall in that is number one that is inter process protection the next one is intra process protection where uh, you know I as a, I have access to my instruction data stack, but I can't overgrow my stack. I can't keep executing beyond my instructions uh, segment. I can't uh, you know uh, access data beyond. So for example, let us take this for P two. This is thousand. Sorry, this is thousand. This is thousand five hundred. This is three thousand five hundred. This is four thousand five hundred. For example. So, I can't store more than 1000 bytes in my stack. I can't access data which is before 1500 or after 3500. All my data should be there. And all the instructions I execute as P2, right, should be in the range between 1000 and 1499, right. If I do something, if I start executing something be before 1000 or after 1499, hardware should catch me. How will it catch? Segmentation will give you a methodology for catch. Okay, so this is what we will learn in the segmentation. The next thing that we will learn is the interrupt service routine. We'll do interrupt ISR next, right? I think we'll do better. Okay, so yeah, we'll do interrupt service routine. So interrupts. So this interrupt has come f uh, in the literature, but I'll try to change that. I'll call it as exceptions. Exceptions are of two types. Traps and interrupts. Okay. So there are uh, n different books and n different books call it in n different ways. Okay. But let us stick to this terminology um, and uh, this is much more neater than what I have seen outside. So, exception, what, what do you mean by exceptional scenario? Today is an exceptional day means what? Something that is not normal has happened, right? Something abnormal has happened. Okay. So, so, when you start executing a program, normally it should execute, but something different than what you expect has been, then it is an exceptional scenario. This exception, can happen due to two things. One is called trap, another is called interrupt. Trap, I am trapped. 
I am interrupted. So what is the difference between I am trapped and I am interrupted? Somebody is trapped. Somebody, when do you, when you are getting trapped? So you do something and you, you fall into some problem. That is called trapping, right? Like divide by zero is my problem, yeah? It is not the operating system's problem. I start executing and ready, I put a zero in the denominator, okay? So it is not operating system's problem, my problem, correct? So I am, this is a trap. I start overgrowing my stack, right? So you had given me only, say, 1,000 locations. I put 1,001 byte into that, okay? So that is, again, a trap because it is my thing, right? It is my mistake as a process, right? I go and start seeing his code. I want to copy his code. I st go and see, start seeing his code. That is again my mistake, correct? So I am not supposed to do some things and I start doing it. Then it is a trap. And the, oper and the hardware, my architecture should find out that I am trying to do something which I am not supposed to do, catch me and go and take me to the operating system and say this fellow is doing some fraud, okay? You are getting this, right? So, that is what we call as a trap, okay? I am doing all correctly. Some keyboard is trying to give an interrupt. Some disk is trying to give an interrupt. There is an urgent thing. Somebody is pressing control C. Somebody has gone, sat on top of the keyboard, okay? So, this is not my mistake. So, the interrupt is coming from some external source. Some timer is giving interrupt. Get out, okay? So this is all, I am, this is not my problem, it is coming from some external and that is called an interrupt, okay? The moment there is a trap or there is an interrupt, immediately what will happen? The hardware will shut down this process and bring the operating system into existence. The operating system will go and service your trap or service your interrupt. Are you getting this, right? What do you mean by servicing your trap or servicing interrupt? If you are doing divide by zero, it will say divide, division by zero error, chuck, throw you out, okay? Right? If it is a stack overflow, it says stack overflow. If it is a segmentation, seg fault, core dump, it can give you and go off, okay? So, but there are cases which we will see where when there is a, where is a trap, then it will say, no, no, wait. It will go and do something and allow you to continue, right? There are, there are scenarios, you will see that. So, all exceptional scenarios that you land up because of your mistake as a process, you call it as a trap. <coughs> all exceptional scenarios due to external sources that you call it as interrupt. Am I clear? Now, whenever there is a trap, whenever there is an interrupt, we need to service. The operating system has to come in and service. Who will deduct the interrupt or the trap? The hardware will deduct the interrupt or the trap. And it is all, the hardware is also responsible for transferring control to a part of the operating system. That part will start executing and it will do the service. This whole thing is what you will learn in your second assignment, namely interrupt service routine. Hmm? Clear? Okay. Now the third is virtual memory. When you write a program, do you really care about how much memory is there? No. When you write a program, you do not care about lot of things. You do not care about how much memory is there, what is the compiler, what everything, right? One of the important thing is you do not care about what the memory is, right? Suppose you are given a 32 bit architecture, what is the maximum addressable memory? 4 GB, 2 power 32 bytes. So that it will be byte addressable architecture. What do you mean by byte addressable architecture? Every byte can be individually ad addressed. So if I have a 32 bit byte addressable architecture, that means I could store up to 2 power 32 bytes. So 4 GB RAM I can have. Within that 4 GB, some will be occupied by some process, some will be occupied by some other process. So, so many things will be occupied by so many processes, correct? And your process will occupy only some part of the memory, but you can still write a program which is as large as 4 GB in terms of 
it can handle huge data, it can handle huge stack and some code. Okay? I can have a very big program and still get it executed on a machine which has physical memory of even 2 GB. Correct? I could still have a 4 GB size program execute on a RAM of size 2 GB. So as far as the programmer is concerned, the operating system says, hey, there is 4 GB available to you. So the programmer assumes that there is 4 GB and he writes the program. The compiler assumes that it is 4 GB and it compiles the program. Correct? Now, the operating system, take it has only say four, 2 GB RAM in which it can give probably say some 512 KB for uh, fi, or 512 MB for this program. Within that 512 MB, it will somehow execute that 4 GB program and give back. So as far as, uh, so how, do, how does it happen? That is what we are going to learn in virtual memory. Right? So as far as the programmer is concerned, he is not bothered about how much physical RAM is there. He, he is given, the operating system presents a view of 4 GB, both for the programmer and for the compiler. Compiler assumes that there is 4 GB. Compiler assumes that there, programmer assumes that there is 4 GB. And he writes the program. The program gets executed. Right? The operating system will take care of executing a 4 GB RAM, 4 GB program on say a 512 MB RAM. Okay. How does it happen? This cannot happen again with just the operating system support. Uh, right? There is a hardware support that is needed and an operating system support that is needed. So we will understand what the hardware does and what the operating system does with respect to virtual memory. And the last thing is about what we call as task switching. So what is task switching? So if you look at Linux, right, there is something called supervisor mood, root, root, and there is some normal user. Root is sort of dada, okay. Today all of you do every action with your mobile phone, right? Those days when all programs have to be written and you pa you forget your password in your, uh, you know, in your DCF, right? Root is God, okay. Night you should call him, say, come reset here, I forgot my password. He will abuse you. All this you should take, ah, what beautiful words here, come on. <laughs> now you don't need all, you have your personal laptop and first, first your fathers are rich to give you a laptop. Second thing is, ah, means that you, it's your father's money, right? So use it properly, okay. Second thing that you need not, now the notion of a DCF is gone, right? At last, the last semester assignment you did in your laptop, correct? So lab in the, lab is in the lap, okay, right? So. So now this, this semester also you can do it here. You need not actually go to a lab to do a computer science lab, okay, fine. So but those days, root is, and even today when you look at major infrastructures today, like you know, your uh, mail servers, right, your CSE mail server, CSE is a small thing, but if you look at a bank mail server, right, or a bank, uh, uh, you know, database. So the admin is a very powerful guy. Right? So there, is, there are certain things that you can do as an administrator. There are certain things that you can do as a normal user. So the entire system should have two parts. One is the supervisor mode, or two modes, I should say. One is the supervisor mode, another is the user mode. So all the programs, normal user program run in the user mode, while all some very important things like accessing devices, etc., will happen in the supervisor mode. So. As a program, right, as a process, I can belong to the operating system. I can also belong to a normal user. So the process can be classified as a user process as a OS process. The OS process runs in a different mode. The user process runs in some different mode. Right? So each process has a privilege. If I am a OS process, I am a little more dada than the normal user process, correct? So every process has something called a privilege level, right? So in a typical four-tier operating system, okay, there is something called kernel that's in, inside, 
After that there would be some system programs like device drivers etc. Then there will be some middleware like your runtime environments, the virtual machine you saw last time right. So, those, those type of things or your compilers etc. So, these are some uh, development uh, layer, development aids right uh, or we can call it as middleware and above this will sit your application program. Right? So, there is privilege level, privilege level 0, privilege level 1, privilege level 2, privilege level 3. The most powerful is the kernel followed by device driver, followed by development aids, followed by application. So, this is what you call as a tired operating system, or tired, tired or multi-tired operating system. Tire means it is multi, right? Okay. Tire operating system. Fine. Okay. So, the, the architecture, what is the support of the architecture for you know maintaining these privilege levels? Every process should be associated with one of these privilege levels. I am a process means am I a process of privilege level 3 or 2 or 1 or 0? Somewhere I have to maintain that information. And when I want to switch from one privilege level to another privilege level, I should do it with some amount of care. I got arbitrarily switch. Then what happens? I become a, if I could arbitrarily switch from privilege level 3 to privilege level 0, then I become the super user and change all your passwords. Correct? So, there should be some amount of protection that is necessary. So, all these things basically, uh, so how to maintain these privilege levels and how to switch from one privilege level to another privilege level. These are the things that we will uh, learn in the fourth assignment which is task switching. Okay. Now, as you see here, we have been more or less I have been talking about one point very, very clearly here, right. All these four assignments finally has one flavor which is what we call as the security. Right? So, I think I have told in the previous uh, course, if you look at 1980 to 90, what was the thrust in computing? Engineering computations. Okay? How do I solve Runge Kutta method fast? How will I compute cost hyperbolic fast? How will I do atmospheric uh, weather calculations fast? These are all the big thing. So, they were talk about how many million instructions I can do per second. 1990 to whatever, 2000, the whole story was media, right? Jurassic Park, how will I shoot movies, how will I do all multimedia, all these things. So, it was all consumer, how to attract a consumer towards computing, a non-computing consumer to computing, right? So, to, to, to buy a computer, basically media, media players, all these things. Consumer electronics came up in a big way, their computers got used. 2000 to 2010, this is all mobile, correct? Now, 2010 to 2033, here I am going to retire. <laughs> This is going to be security. Right? Actually, 34. <laughs> okay? Because now you have started using your, with all the cashless and all these things and coming in place. I think that is the way economy is going to grow. Uh, that is the way, you know, world is going to move. So, it is going towards, so you are going to do lot of e-commerce your health is going to get maintained by your uh, you know mobile phone it's already very close to your heart okay right more uh, closer than your girlfriend or boyfriend right or wife okay no problem <laughs> <laughs> right right so now when you have started using these things in the great way then there's lot of things that we need to do so that you know your 
your confidential data other things are not compromised okay it's very very important and so security is something like you know it's like a habit which should uh, suppose you have been sleeping in every co class on the last class i say keep awake you not know, to be very difficult so in the initial days itself you should get used to a habit not at the end now unfortunately last 40 30 40 years computers have been in existence nobody gave a damn for security suddenly one fine day you say i want to make this secure i have one one 10 million lines of uh, operating system and uh, middleware code and executing on 1 billion transistors now what why do they talk about security right i want to retrofit security into this security is a habit and at the age of 50 you try to for a computer you are trying to say now you you inculcate this habit in a very big way it's not going to happen so easily right so first thing is first people should start talking about security in the courses right that itself we have not talked right today can you buy a cpu with a single core no right cpu with a single core the 80 85 something is now 4000 dollars because it's ethnic value okay so okay the last 50 left out and they'll sell it okay now we have multiple cores now how many if you just take sigma of across the world university curriculum including all our own courses how many courses are teaching parallel algorithm you learn data structure you learn compiler even what i taught you did i tell about parallel how to do this in parallel no we are only still talking about sequential program correct this multi core started somewhere in 2004 12 years curriculums have not matured to talk about concurrent programming at all whatever be the reason okay there are many reasons we can talk about that philosophy later but now something which is a decayed old we have not still adapted now we are going to talk about and that is much more simpler to handle as a concept as a technology as a process than what we are talking for security correct because there everything is at least open for us to understand in security we don't know what is inside we don't know what is does anyone know over 1 million lines of unix code even the original originator of unix may not know is not that what a code does what it what it does when it is interacting with other parts of code so the a, a security issue is not about just one piece of code but multiple components trying to do suppose there is a breach in say uh, uh, you know yeah in a credit card swiping that breach could happen because of 20 different vendors today you understand 20 different people are involved to, from the moment you swipe a card to the point it goes to your bank account and it says no you up, you get a approval right 20 different components are there so if i talk about breach somebody says no for a breach you should be responsible somebody says it's not we can't assign responsibility today there are 20 different fellows who are involved and the fault can be on multiple people the fault can be on no one right i have done correctly he has also done correctly but the way we both interact there is some fault now whom do we uh, uh, give the responsibility of this interaction right correct right some some major company says that they will keep the server in the sea in, in some international waters then they are not bound by the tax rules of any of the nations right if i keep it in international water then i it's not india it's not china it is not pakistan or anybody so i will not pay tax to anyone okay you got my point so if i keep my server and do business in international waters then no country can uh, claim tax no to which, which country will i pay right so th- this type of this is this is philosophically the question that we are trying to answer so today security is becoming a very very big issue and for us to learn security we have to learn from the grassroots level that's 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 my call here so that is why one of the lectures that i had sent the youtube videos and other things uh, which basically talks about all the four assignments that i have put here those are the beginning points of you know making your system secure and 5 to 10 years later the biggest jobs will not be in your uber or your morgan stanley or your goldman sachs it will be in security even if you go there it will be in security so let us try and give you a vision about that 
and that is what we will be covering here. Okay. So, my whole thing will have a thrust on security because that is what I feel is the next gen hot topic when you all go out into the market. You do cloud computing, you do data analytics, you do everywhere there will be a security, there will be a privacy issue, there is some NDA that you need to sign. Right? So, you should understand those languages. I think I have to train you and that is what we will be doing in this course. Okay? Mm -hmm.